tonight we're going to talk about a, a frequently abused passage. I think this passage is actually really regularly abused and we don't want to overly allegorize it because that's, that's the abuse that I often see with this passage of Jesus calming the waters, right? They're in the boat, there's a storm, Jesus says, peace be still. Um, so this is, the problem here is that people miss the main point of the passage and it's not about Jesus getting you through the storms of your life. I'm sorry. I'm not saying that's not a point. I'm saying that's not the main point. And so I want to give due to the main point of the passage. It's not about the storms of my life, actually. It's about who Jesus is. So uh, pretty profound stuff, pretty neat stuff. Um, we're in Mark uh, chapter 4, verse 35. This is the Mark series part 15. If you're watching online, you can get the playlist in the description down below for the entire Mark playlist as we go verse by verse through the whole book. We're just going to start now by reading the whole section. It's Mark 4, 35 through 41. We're just going to read through it, get it like sort of stored up in your mind, freshly in your mind. Then we're going to go over it more slowly. So here we go. Verse 35. On that day, when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Now, they're in the Sea of Galilee. So he's like, let us go over to the other side of the sea. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And all the like the bare bones we need to understand what just happened is right here in the passage. Like it's it's right there in the passage. But um, let me just remind us where I think the, uh, the abuse, the misuse of this passage sometimes happens. And I'm not saying there's nothing true in this. I'm saying that when you make this the whole thing, you've missed the passage. Um, the focus is usually on help, God helping us through trials. Jesus is with us in the storm. That's the idea. And if he's asleep and he's at peace, then you can be at peace too. Um, but I can't imagine what would have happened if all the disciples just went to bed. Right then and there on the boat, they'd all be dead now. I mean, I'm not just saying it doesn't perfectly parallel the, you know, the application that it's being given. So this can be helpful. The problem is this is not the primary focus of the passage. That's the first problem. The second problem is this. It can lead us to stretching the text of Scripture. And it's a habit that sometimes helps our hearts, but it doesn't help us understand God's Word. And so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of confront that a little bit, at least to the best of my ability, why I think that this is not um, the, the proper method of Bible study to just immediately go to the storms of your life with this passage. It can actually hurt your ability to read and study the Bible if you too often allegorize everything so that it's about whatever you're going through in the moment. Because the Bible is sometimes about what you're going through in the moment. But it's not always just that. And you can miss out on the theology you're being taught because you're, you're only reading it to find one thing. How is this going to get me through my day? And then you can be missing out on all these other layers of meaning and stuff that are in the text. So, what is the main focus? The main focus is the identity of Jesus. We get this because at the very end they say, Who then is this? This is the response to all this stuff in verse 41. They're like, well, then who is this? Who's who? Who's Jesus? That this event that just happened revealed something about who Jesus is. And that's the thing that we might miss. And I'm going to get into that because it's actually really neat stuff. So let's dig in with that in mind. Um, I do want to apply it to our lives and it will affect our allegorical storms. I just want to, when we get to that section towards the end, I want to talk about how we just are cautious about applying it to things like that. And we do it thoughtfully rather than recklessly. At least that's my understanding of the scriptures. So Mark 4.35 says, On that day, when evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Okay, this is already interesting because the stuff that's about to happen is triggered because Jesus himself says, This is the plan. We're going to go and cross over. We're going to go to the other side. Um, The time of day is evening. This is a potentially more dangerous time to get up on the Sea of Galilee. Is in the evening time. Uh, Jesus, he's not a fisherman, but he is in charge, right? They're the fishermen. They know the Sea of Galilee like nobody else does. And they know the perils of the sea and all that kind of thing. But it's already interesting because Jesus is the one that says, hey, let's, let's get in the boats and cross over at that time. Then verse 36 says, leaving the crowd. Now I say leaving the crowd, let's just remind ourselves of what happened last week. We were going through Mark and we're looking at Jesus. He's 
preaching these parables, he's in a boat, possibly at a place called Sower's Cove in the Sea of Galilee. And he's in this boat and he's preaching to the crowd that's up on the land. Kind of a natural amphitheater in this area of Galilee. So he's sitting in the boat. The crowd's there. He dismisses the crowd and he's like, now let's just get in the boat and go the other way. So leaving the crowd, they took, uh, they took him along with them in the boat just as he was and other boats were with him. And here's two phrases that I think are interesting in verse 36. Just as he was. Why just as he was? What does this mean, just as he was? Is it like just a, just as he was? Because if you take Jesus, you better take him just as he is. Well, we'll be like, well, that's a good application, but it probably isn't what this is about, you know. <laughs> it's true, you better take the real Jesus as he really is, but I don't think that's the application. It probably means... Jesus was already in the boat. So then they get in and they're like, just let's go. So they take him just as he is already in the boat. That is probably the application right there. Um, Because he spoke to the crowd from the boat. It says also that other boats were with him. And this is something that nobody ever talks about. Did you ever notice this passage? There's other boats. Wait, did these other boats like go through the storm? They don't seem to be around at the end of the storm. Did they just, you know, did they like run away at some point or did they travel for a bit and then go back? And there's just no details that I see in scripture to tell us what happened to these other boats. Now, here's why I find this interesting. I don't know what happened to these other other boats, you know, maybe they just turned back. But what's interesting about it is it reads like a memory. It reads like someone's recounting, this is just what happened. Like they're telling the story and they're like, oh yeah, so as he was in the boat, we took him in. There were other boats with him. And they don't even come back to that to talk about it again. But when you report memories, this is what you do too. I remember it was a Tuesday. Yeah, and oh yeah, and I had that, that, that dumb sweater that I got for Christmas on. I remember that. You know, and you just have these little details you throw in there because it's a, a memory recall thing. Whereas if you're fabricating a story, those little details tend to be all left out. And so I think that's just interesting in the text of Mark because it's like a memory, a random detail of memory retold. Nothing else about them later. Then in verse 37, it says, And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So again, we don't know what happened to the other boats. Now it's just the one boat with Jesus and the disciples. Um, The Sea of Galilee, to understand this a little bit better, um, it is known for perilous sudden storms. Um, This is actually something it's known for, especially during certain times of year. And so there's records, even recently, of boats being lost to sudden storms. Boats of fishermen who know their business on the lake. You know, they know what they're doing. So they knew the risks. And again, evening trips in particular are a little more risky than others. The Sea of Galilee itself is about 700 feet below sea level. So it sits in like a, a deep valley. The Jordan River flows downhill into it. It flows into the sea at about 700 feet sea level. The Jordan River flows out of the sea at the south point and flows down to the Dead Sea, which is much even lower. It's, the Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater body of water on Earth. The Dead Sea is the lowest saltwater body of water on Earth, interestingly. Um, but there's great fishing there, and it's a really neat environment. You can grow food there really easily because of this lower altitude and there's just the dynamics of the environment. However, there's these mountains around it, and there's these winds that sometimes come racing down the mountains. They, meet, they get the cool air coming off the mountains that meets the warm air on the, on the sea. And it can create sudden disturbances. You know, um, weather, basically bad weather that can be very sudden. Now, what's interesting is we actually found a boat in 1986 in the Sea of Galilee that dates to the time of Christ. Many of you guys have heard of this. You've you've seen the archaeology photos of this boat that they found all collapsed out. But there it was. And it was about 26 feet long, about 7 feet wide. Originally, not flattened out 7 feet wide. But it it would have fit about 15 guys using the boat, working in the boat, um, that could have fit to be traveling around. So it fits with Jesus and his disciples. This may have been kind of the style boat that they had. Perhaps. This this boat dated sometime between 120 BC and um, 40 AD. So it's somewhere in that region. That's what they think. Um, So Jesus' idea, let's head out there. Let's go, simple trip. We're just going to cross over. We're just going to cross over the the Sea of Galilee, made into this something that's very dangerous and very treacherous. And I do feel like we get this kind of thing all the time. You're going about life and you think you're just going to do this simple thing and it's not so simple and all of a sudden it gets really bad and really hairy and really tough and so there's some application to our lives there Um, but what I think is the most shocking thing that happens here is when they wake up Jesus and they say 
don't you care that we're dying? That to me is extremely revealing. I think the words are, are very important. Don't you care that we're dying? I get this. And I get this in, in my own life, and I think you get it in yours. When the trials you're going through have you asking, does God even care about what I'm going through? This is very different than help, Lord, I need help. That's a very different kind of prayer. Help, I need help. That, that's still a prayer of faith. That's still a prayer of trust. But this is more like, I'm not even sure that you care about me. This, I think, is, and I'll come to this later, I think it's why they get rebuked for lack of faith. Um, this kind of hits hard, and this is where I think application to all of us is pretty relevant. You will go through times of life where there are struggles and there are trials and there are hardships, and you, you may find that your faith in God's character, not just his power, his character, his goodness, his love for you, that that is challenged because you see yourself in the middle of this hardship and you feel like he could stop this. You could do something and you're not. I get this. And in this, there's an application for us today, for sure. Um, I think it's pretty big. But let's, let's come back to that a little bit later. Um, verse 39. Verse 39. It says, And he got up. Jesus wakes. He responds to them. He gets up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. So this is like a sudden change. Sudden boom. It goes from crazy wind and dangerous storm to just nothing. Then in verse 40, he rebukes them. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith. That's a pretty strong rebuke that he gives them. And then they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? So it quickly calmed. Like I said, in verse 39, when it says it became perfectly calm, it's in the, the, in the Greek, there's these different, I'm not going to try and teach you guys Greek here, but I just want to mention that I didn't make this up. Okay. <laughs> the Greek, it does talk about, um, there are different uh, past tenses. There, it's, the aorist is basically the way they say past tense. And there's different senses in which you can have past tense. Past tense, continual action, action that stopped sometime in the past. And so there's more nuance in the way they form a word in the Greek that we don't have in the English. Sometimes we can get some nuance out of it from the Greek. Um, the aorist sense in verse 39 that the wind died down and became perfectly calm, it implies a suddenness, not a gradual dying down. That's all I'm saying here. Suddenly, whew, so it would have been obvious to them this was in response to the command of Jesus. Boom, he commands it, it calms down suddenly. This was obviously a miracle. Uh, some commentators, they want to take everything that happens in the Bible and try to make it a natural event. Now, what sort of coincidence could occur here to explain this? And this works for certain miracles, right? Like when you read about certain stuff happening, perhaps um, uh, just a flood happening at the right time, or even some of the descriptions of the Red Sea crossing about waters piling up early, you know, further on. You read some of this stuff and you go, yeah, some of this can be explained with natural events, in which case God's designing of the moment that it happened right when it was needed, this sort of random, unlikely event, was the miracle. Other times this doesn't work at all. Right? Like Moses throws down his staff and it turns into a snake. I'm like, what is your natural, naturalistic explanation for this? Like, I don't think it was, well, some snakes get really hard and people can't tell that there's snakes. I don't think that this is, you know, you can't explain this away. And I think that part of it is a modern allergy to miracles. We basically, um, we disbelieve them without justification rather than, as opposed to the opposite, believing any miracle story without any investigation or any research. Both of these two are probably a bad place to be. But here, I'll say um, it, it's miraculous. That's the point. Jesus did an actual miracle. Right? He, he, he commanded and it was, it was stilled just like that. Others will say that when Jesus rebukes the wind, that this is a demonic exorcism that Jesus is performing on the wind. Anybody heard that before? This is what some, some commentators will say. It's a demonic exorcism Jesus is performing on the wind. And I've read multiple commentaries. It's funny, it's, when, it's always good if you're going to read commentaries to read multiple commentaries. Because what one commentator says, this is so obvious. The next one's like, that is so obviously the opposite of that, right? Like, and they, everybody thinks it's so obvious, no matter what their opinion is. And you being, reading only one comment, commentary can just get jerked around a little bit sometimes, to be honest. Um, so let me expose you to two sides of this issue. Some will say this is exorcism language because um, he, he, uh, he says, 
hush, be still. And so he says, like, be quiet to the wind, hush. Like he told the demon to be quiet previously in Mark. The other word they, they hook it on is verse 39 where it says he rebuked the wind. And they say rebuke and be quiet. These are things that speak of demonic exorcism. Exorcism. Try saying that word too many times. It just starts to turn into some sort of a tongue twister. Um, well, I think that this is wrong. And here's a couple of reasons why. One, it's just two verbs. Rebuke and be quiet. These words are not like fancy technical terms for exorcism. In fact, even in Mark, Jesus, re- in fact, even in this passage, he rebukes the disciples. He rebukes them. We don't think, well, they were obviously possessed at that point. Like the word rebuke is frequently used having nothing to do with exorcisms. So I don't think that this wind was demonic. I don't think we're getting that from the passage. I'll put it that way. He did treat it like it's like it's personified in a sense. But I think it's speaking of his control over the weather and all that. Um, the other, the other one is be quiet, which he, I mean, he's just telling you what to do, be quiet. And I don't think there's anything about that that is um, ritualistically exorcism. Plus, another point is this. In the Gospel of Mark, now, okay, in Jewish, let me back up, in Jewish texts from Jesus' time and thereabouts, exorcism did have a lot of key words, things you had to do, things, things that they would say, rituals they would engage in. And all that stuff is curiously missing from the Gospel of Mark. When Jesus casts out a demon, he's just like, get out, and it goes. He doesn't do any of those things. And Mark, as you look through Mark, he doesn't have this sort of ritual you know, method that Jesus uses for exorcisms. He's just responding like someone with authority. That's it. He, just, it's, he has the authority. He tells what to do, and that's what happens. So Mark avoids this sort of um, exorcism terminology. So it's weird to read it into this passage. So I think that commentaries who say that um, Jesus is, is exercising a demonic wind, they just go way too far. I think that we, whatever the court, cause of the wind was, is not actually in question in Mark. It's just that Jesus has power over it. That's the thing. That's the thing. Others will say this passage represents Jesus and Jonah because Jonah was fleeing the presence of the Lord and a great storm arose. And where was Jonah? He was sleeping in the boat. He went down to the depth of the boat and he was asleep there, fast asleep. I don't think that there's a strong connection here between Jesus and Jonah unless you want to make it a contrast and not a comparison. Because Jonah's rebelling against God and that's and he's sleeping in the boat, probably the sleep of like depression because <laughs> there's a different kind of sleep there. Um, whereas Jesus, he's fulfilling the Father's will and here he is asleep in the boat and the storm is not judgment upon him or anything like that, right? Uh, Jonah gets thrown in to stop the storm. Jesus just commands it. So if you want to say there's a relation to Jonah, then the typological relation is Jesus is better than Jonah. That would be, and that's consistent because Jesus is better than Abraham, better than Aaron, the high priest. He's you better than you fill in the blank. Someone greater than Moses is here, uh, greater than Solomon, all of that. So in that sense, there could be a greater than comparison. But here's the main point. So all that's not the main point. Here's the main point. Who is this Jesus guy? This is the thrust. Who then is this that even the wind and and waves obey him? And we have to become a little Jewish in our thinking here to understand how profound what Jesus did is. They see this action of Jesus rebuking the storm and controlling the weather. They see that as revealing not just his power, but his identity. Think about that for a second. To the Jewish mind, something he did made them think, we already thought he's Messiah. But wait a minute, what he just did, what he just did blows us away. Now we're like, but who really is this? So let's think about it a little more deeply. Um, The Old Testament context is this. I'll summarize, then I'm going to give you several passages. We'll look at Psalms in particular. The Old Testament idea is this. God, not man, commands and controls the weather. That's the general Old Testament context. God commands and controls the weather. And here's Jesus commanding and controlling the weather. Even when Elijah prayed and it didn't rain and then he prayed and it did rain, he didn't command anything. He just prayed and then he waited to see what God would do. But Jesus does something far more aggressive and more authoritative than even Elijah did. So in Psalm 65 verses 5 through 8, listen to to this. I'm going to read several Psalms now and hear the Jewish context about the one who can command the weather. 
By awesome deeds, this is Psalm 65, 5. By awesome deeds, you answer us in righteousness, O God of our salvation. You are the trust of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest sea who establish who establishes the mountains by his strength being girded with might, who stills the roaring seas, the roaring of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. God is the one who stills the seas. That's Psalm 65, the roaring of the waves. Psalm 89 verses 8 and 9 say the following. O Lord God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord, your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the swelling of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Now, this is interesting because it's not only saying God does this, but it's one of the who's like you passages of the Old Testament. These happen a lot, right? Where they talk about something God does that nobody else does. And the way they talk about it is they're like, who's like you, Lord? You do this. Nobody's like that. Nobody does that but you, God. And the thing, the example is, he stills the roaring of the seas. Job 38, uh, I won't read the passage, but God is recounting all these things only he does. Hey, Job, were you there? It's the were you there passage. Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? It's all these things Job can't do that just show him his smallness before almighty God. And one of those things is um, that God can put limits on the seas. And it's not like something people can do. In several Psalms, God rebukes the sea. Psalm 1815, Psalm 104, verse 7, Psalm 106, verse 9, Isaiah 50, verse 2, Nahum, chapter 1, verse 4, all of those passages. I hope you wrote all that down real quick as I... Sorry, you can have my notes later. Um, so God rebukes the sea in those passages. It's God. It's Yahweh. It's, it's, it's the God of all creation who controls and rebukes the seas. But listen to this in Psalm 107, because Psalm 107 talks about God's control over various things. Uh, interesting psalm. Some of these things that God controls are types of Christ in some way that connect to Jesus. As you travel through, I love doing this with psalms. You read a psalm and you see how, how it connects to Christ. It's a fun thing to do, actually. But in Psalm 107, verse 23, this is what it says. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on the great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up the, a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. It's, it's like this exaggerated, these giant waves are going up and down, right? They're up to the heavens and down to the depths. They're doing this. Um, their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. So it's describing sailors on the sea in the midst of a massive storm that God has brought upon them. Verse 28. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. This speaks to the identity of Jesus not just the source of his power. Who then is this? Yahweh controls the, the waters. God controls the storms. And Jesus just did this. Some people like to say that Mark, the gospel of Mark, knows nothing of the deity of Christ. And I just think they just don't understand the gospel of Mark. Because what's happening is we're ramping up the deity of Christ throughout the gospel of Mark. I mean, he starts pretty strong when he re seems to imply that Jesus is Yahweh in chapter 1, as we talked about at the beginning of Mark. Jesus then commands demons, and they're calling him the Son of God. He calls himself the Son of Man, which we'll get to later. He even ramps up the meaning of Son of Man uh, as having this, the one who will be worshipped by all nations and all this kind of stuff. Jesus is, um, in fact, I'm going to do it towards the end of the Mark series. We're going to do one day where we just do the deity of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And we're just going to survey all the stuff because I just want it all in one resource for people to have online. I think it's powerful stuff. So a lot of people say this and they use it to try to um, undermine the inspiration of Scripture. Oh yeah, Mark had a whole different Jesus than the Jesus of John. John thinks Jesus is deity, not Mark. And I'm like, but that's the whole point of this passage we're in right here today is that Mark is showing us, showing us, teaching us, not with commentary, but with telling us the stories of what Jesus did, that he is, he is the one, so to speak. He can calm the seas. So this is why they're so scared all of a sudden. Think about this. 
When they were scared of the water, the word is that they, they were afraid in verse 40. They were afraid, so they woke up Jesus, right? He says, why are you so afraid? Why are you afraid? Oh, you, you, why do you have no faith? But in verse 41, after Jesus stills the waters and it's calm and they should be like, oh, cool, things are great. It says they were very much afraid. They're more scared. They're more scared after he does this than before. Now, they were pretty scared before. But also there's more to it. It's a different kind of fear. And here we'll throw some Greek at you briefly because it's two different words for fear. It's probably the same word in English, right? But there's two different words for fear. One is uh, deloi. And deloi means cowardly, fearful, or lacking courage. And that's how they felt when the, when the sea was raging and they thought they were going to die. Cowardly, fearful, lack of courage. Jesus says, why were you afraid? Why were you deloi? The next one is in verse 41 when it describes after they see what Jesus does and they're looking at him. They're not scared of the water anymore, but they look at him and they have a new fear, a new reverence for him. And that's the word that's used. It's um, uh, faban, which can carry a connotation of intimidation or reverence. So it's a different word that can have a different connotation to it. And I can see it. They're scared of these waves. They're going to kill us. But then when they see what Jesus does and they realize the implications of the deity of Christ, of, you know, who is he? He didn't even pray. He just commanded. He didn't call out to God. He just did it. Who is he? And they realize afresh, who is this guy? And it hits them. They already thought he was Messiah. This is different. Who is Messiah? Who is this Messiah? Um, And it blows them away. To understand it better, think of all the Old Testament saints who had encounters with a theophany. Right? They saw, like, the angel of the Lord in particular, who we've talked about, who's a theophany, right? Or Christophany. And when they realized that they were in God's presence, they became scared. And that was the natural reaction to realize whose presence they're in. And this seems to be happening right here. They suddenly realize something about Jesus, and it freaks them out. It freaks them out. Freaks them out. It's strengthened when we realize that this is not them being scared of the sea, but them being (laughs) scared of the revelation of who Christ is. It blows them away. Blows them away. Now, what's interesting about this is they saw miracles before. Like, they've seen Jesus heal people. They've seen him exercise demons. They've seen him do all kinds of things. But this was different. This was qualitatively different than the other miracles they'd seen Jesus do. And we get that when we realize the Jewish context of who it is that calms the storms, who it is that controls the weather. Even, and that's why they say, um, who is this that even the wind and sea obey him. Like we know he's cast out demons. We know he healed sickness, but even the wind and sea, this is like whoop up here, next level. Healing demons, wind and sea, like they understand the the connotation that's being communicated here. This isn't new to Mark. Um, Again, in Mark 1, he starts off by calling Jesus Yahweh, the the whole concept of the Son of Man, the fact that Jesus has the ability to forgive, and it's going to continue ramping up. In Mark 4, we we get this miracle here in Mark 4 that's greater than some of the other stuff Jesus has done in the past. In Mark 5, we're going to get an exorcism that's greater than any exorcism previously recorded. Right? We are legion. It's about the magnitude of what he's doing to demonstrate who he is and his power and control. Mark is about who Jesus is and what Jesus' mission is and how both of those things were not fully understood until it was revealed by Christ. That's the mystery revealed. The identity of Christ and the work of Christ. In other words, the gospel. Jesus and what he does for us. This is the thing that's being revealed. Um, Now, this led me to uh, down this road. That's the main point. That's the main point, I think, in this passage. The the focus is the identity of Christ, recognizing Jesus for who he is. Um, Our culture needs to hear this uh, because our culture frequently looks at Jesus and decides to make him into whatever whatever our gut desires. And just a watered down version of Christ. We don't realize that like we're 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 in the boat with the Lord of all creation, you know? And there there's a proper sense of intimidation. There's a proper godly godly fear, not a terror like like he might unexpectedly kill me for no reason or something. It's not like that. It's not like we we have terror because he has good character. But there's a reverence for his his goodness, his power, his might that we, we should have. And uh, that's missing in a lot of people's mental theology. Their, their sort of personal Christian theology, there's just no reverence for Jesus. Alike, they like him, but there's that reverence. So um, so anyways, moving to, towards application and stuff, I want to ask this question. What exactly was wrong with the fear of the disciples? Because I really puzzled over this as I was prepping in Mark here. 
What was wrong with their fear? What was wrong with their fear? Um, in verse 40, Jesus says, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? This seems to be two sides of the same coin. It's like, hey, you're afraid because you have no faith. Okay, that's an easy answer. They were lacking faith. That's why they were scared. And I can testify that this is my life as well. That when I'm fearful in that kind of fear, you know, the despair kind of fear, that it is, it is a lack of faith. It is a lack of trust in God at that moment, at that time, that that is the case. But what exactly was lacking? Were they supposed to believe they would survive? Like, what was it they were supposed to believe that they weren't believing? That's the question I kind of puzzled on for a while. Like, what did the disciples fail to believe? Were they supposed to be like, hey, I don't care how bad the storm gets, I know we're going to survive. Because Jesus said we're going to cross over, so we're going to cross over. It, that might be it. There's something you're connecting it to something Jesus said. Okay, that, that's a possibility. Um, I find this hard to apply into my life. Because God hasn't given me a special word that everything in my life is going to work. You know? And I'm going through something and I'm thinking like, well, where's my lack? It's a lack of faith, Mike. And I'm like, well, if Jesus told me I was going to make it, I'd trust him. <laughs> but he didn't tell me I was going to make it through this, you know? I don't know what's going to happen next. And so I don't have like this word to hang on about, about future prosperity or making it through a scenario. I, I, have, I have other words to hang on. God will work all things together for good, right? To godliness with contentment. He's with me. So let me learn to be content with these. I know he's using the trial in my life for his glory. So these are things I hang on to, but I can't be like, but I will yet succeed because I don't really know what's going to happen next. That might happen, it might not. So I find that hard to apply into my life. Um, unless I apply it to the ultimate crossing over. The ultimate crossing over into his presence. And then I go, oh, okay, well that applies. And that, that's a storm of life for sure. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to be heading into his presence for sure. Um, it could be belief in God regardless of peril. And this, I think, applies better to me. And it fits the context. The context is, they wake Jesus up, you don't care that we're going to die. Not, you're not helping us, it's you don't care. And that definitely applies to life scenarios where you go through struggles and you question. You know, your heart questions. Does God care? Does the Lord care about me or what I'm going through right now? And you realize now your faith's being tested. Faith isn't about believing I'll be successful in whatever I'm doing. Sometimes faith is about believing God is good regardless of what I'm going through. Trusting in his heart regardless of the circumstances of the moment. And that, I find, applies all the time. I think that's going on here. Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Why do you have no faith? What's the thing they should have done? They should have believed that he cared. That's one thing they should have done. Believe that he cared. I can maybe help this a little bit by asking a hypothetical question. This helped me as I was trying to study it. My hypothetical question is, let's imagine the disciples are back in the boat. The storm's raging. Jesus is asleep in the stern as he was on this pillow. There he is sleeping. They're back in the boat. But this time they have faith. They really have faith. What do they do differently now that they have faith? Do they just say, let Jesus sleep. Let's just keep on paddling. We'll be fine. We got faith. I, I think that maybe they would die if that had been their attitude. I'm thinking that the, the faithful act wasn't don't wake up Jesus because we're fine. I don't think that that was the faithful act. I think that they would have woke Jesus up, but they wouldn't have said, don't you care? Instead, they would have said, Lord, help. We, we, know, we know you can help. Help us. Save us. I think that would have been the act of faith. So they weren't necessarily rebuked for calling out for help or deliverance from the scenario. That it was, the rebuke was because of not trusting in his character, in his goodness, in his kindness, because trials can feel overwhelming and you can feel like God doesn't care. And guess what? Your feelings can be wrong. They frequently are. My feelings are wrong a lot. And I've had to learn this and you have to like sort of check yourself and be like, I know I'm feeling this way. It's wrong, but I'm still feeling it, but I don't trust my feelings right now. There's just seasons where you can't rely on how you feel and you have to rely on his goodness and his character. So I, I think they would have asked him for help. Um, you, you could say, well, no, if they had faith, they would have commanded the, the sea themselves, Mike. And I think that this is not true. Um, where, where do we ever see the disciples commanding weather? And don't be like, well, they never had a chance. Well, no, they actually, they do have chances to command the weather. Paul, the apostle, was in a massive storm for days where the people on the ship were like, we're going to die. They despaired of life. They're like, let's just chuck the, 
chuck the prisoners overboard so they don't get so they don't escape they had already thrown the tackle off the board they'd already done all these changes to the ship lost a lot of revenue and they thought we're all going to die why didn't paul at any point just get up and be like peace be still i dare say because he doesn't have we don't inherit this power over weather like some people want to say that we have i don't think that's a biblical thing i don't think that that if i just had enough faith you know um i think if god tells me he's going to do that and inspires my heart with faith to trust him for it, then I'm going to go for it. But I'm going to trust him to do that. I don't think it's like a power that resides in me to stir up and force the weather. I've, I've tried. I can't even get a light switch to flip on and off like that. So um, so when Paul was going through this in Acts 27, he never commands the weather. Instead, he says this. He receives a message from an angel and he, he says this in Acts 27, 23. For this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood before me saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men. For I believe, God, that it will turn out exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. We're going to actually run aground. The ship's going to run aground. The storm's going to play out and finish what it's doing. There's no like, he had a, in other words, Paul has faith. He has a word from God, but it's not to stop the storm. It's just to weather it out and wait it out. And we're going to be okay. And so I don't think that the act of faith would be for them to command the weather. I don't think that's in the passage. I bring this up because I hear people say this on television. So, um, yeah, if they had faith, they simply would not have said, God, you don't care. You don't care. Jesus, you don't care about what I'm going through. That's the lack of faith. That's the challenge of faith. I can give you one more support for this. In the book of Acts, Agabus is, is a prophet. And he's speaking prophetically to the church in the book of Acts. And he prophesies that there will be famine in the land. Some sort of major famine. So the church gathers resources and they send it to Jerusalem. Resources to help the saints there who were going through this hardship and famine. Why on earth didn't they just command it away? Well, they, because that's not how it works. I mean, it'd be cool if God just gave us all superpowers. Um, it wouldn't even require faith anymore, right? We just could command everything all the time. <laughs> no hardship whatsoever, right? I, I just, I command myself a raise. I command my, my back pain to disappear. I command my, my family to all get saved. And you just, I just command everything. I wouldn't need faith. I would just be living the, the, my own sort of creation world, like we're all playing some sort of modified Minecraft thing. All right. So anyway, think about that. Um, I think there's a perfect example of the kind of faith they should have had in Daniel chapter 3. I love this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know the story, right? These three are about to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And here's what they say to Nebuchadnezzar. And it would sound like a contradiction to some, but it's not if you understand what it means to have faith in a scenario like this. Daniel 3.17, they say, because he's like, I'm going to destroy you. No one can stop me. They say in verse 17, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. There's that proclamation of faith, right? God will deliver us, but they go on. But... Even if he doesn't. Did you ever catch when they said that? <laughs> like, but even if he doesn't, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. This, but even if he doesn't, that's serious faith. You know what? I think God's going to deliver me from this thing I'm going through. But I'll tell you what, even if he doesn't, I still trust him. I still rest in his promises and in his goodness and in his character. And there's an act of faith. There's an act of faith. I think is. That's fearlessness. Okay, now I want to talk about the allegori allegorizing. The allegorizations. As you see, I am, I am definitely cool with saying, hey, you go through storms of life. And this does apply to that. But I think the main point is the identity of Jesus. The secondary point is about these trials we go through. Um, the question, though, is how far can we take this passage in, an, in the sense of allegory? Is it even fair for me to be like, their storms equal your storms in some sense? Can I say that? And I think we can, actually. In Isaiah 43, there's an example of this. You know, Israel's gone through literal physical storms, but Isaiah 43 applies it to metaphorical storms. It's interesting. Isaiah 43, verse 1 and 2. But now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name in your mind. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. 
God's past deliverances of the people of Israel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like them going through the, through the, um, the Red Sea, the crossing. These things are taken as, as allegory that God is with you and God will protect you and God will take care of you. That's the allegory for Israel, the application is directly to them. But I do think it's fair to say that the events that we read about are examples to apply to our lives. That is something we should do. The question is how far can we take it? Um, can I say Jesus will always calm my storm? Or like, well, no, sometimes I'm going to die in the storm. Like, actually pass away. Like, I'll get an illness that doesn't go away and I'll go to, I'll go to my deathbed and I'll be like, well, he does something better than calming the storm. He delivers me for, for, to eternal life in his presence. So I'm not, I'm not saying you can apply it in that sense. Simplistic way of God will always stop whatever really bugs me. That obviously is not, I, don't th- I think we flatten out God's plan for our lives when we say stuff like that. Um, so I see some truth in this asleep in the storm thing. Um, some say, though, one, another application is Jesus is asleep in the boat. And if he's asleep, he's asleep because he's very calm and collected. And Jesus was always calm and collected. He was such a peaceful person. He was such a peaceful man, always calm and collected. And therefore, when I'm in the middle of stress and trials, I should always be calm and collected. And I just want to say, like, all it says is he was asleep. All that other stuff I just added, didn't I? Like, it, the other points I'm drawing from the text, I'm drawing from the text, right? He says, why are you fearful? They said, don't you care about us? So I'm, I'm teaching on these points because they're right there in the text. But there's nothing about Jesus being calm and collected. What if he was just tired? I mean, he frequently would go all night in prayer. He had just taught the crowds who were cr- cramming in around him for who knows how long. The evening comes and he crashes. He's not the, he's not the boat guy, so he's sleeping while they're doing the work. Because that's not his job. It's not his focus. He might have just been really tired. I've known people who sleep when they work hard and then they sleep, they're out. You know what I'm talking about? They can sleep like on, in any circumstance. I'm the opposite of this person, right? I just lay there and not sleep and not sleep. In fact, I started exercising not too long ago and it actually helped me sleep. So a little help for you if you can't sleep, start exercising more. I know that's not the pill you wanted, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, it, but it helps. Um, so it's possible Jesus is just tired. He's just sleeping. And if you want to say Jesus was always calm and collected, like no matter how bad things were around him, he was always like little, a small grin, you know, and he was just like, ah, don't worry, guys. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's all good. It's all good. Well, there's times where Jesus is just in anguish, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's in anguish. Listen to what it says in Mark, same book, verses, uh, chapter 14, verse 33 and 34. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and troubled. That's Jesus. He was distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Now, Jesus was not scared, like fearful, like, oh, what's going to happen next? I don't know. He just knew that there was major suffering and hardship coming his way. And he was aware of this and it was unpleasant. So I don't have to like have this artificial peace. I can be like, I'm in anguish, but I still trust God. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. We are, we, are, we are living that situation. So some, I think, they go too far with this about Jesus. Um, I've heard a teaching, and I've heard it, it and I'm going to mention it, the, where I've heard it from because I've heard it repeatedly now. Um, but Bill Johnson uh, from uh, Bethel Church, I would take exception to his interpretation of this passage with Jesus in the boat. He says that Jesus had peace. That's why he was asleep. He was asleep in the boat because he had peace. He was able to speak peace into the storm because He had peace to give, like he tapped into some sort of peace thing that he has and he sort of let it out, right? He released, they like the term release very a lot in this circle. He released peace. Um, And the idea is that Jesus, and to quote Bill Johnson, he says, Jesus lived in a realm of peace. He was living in a realm of peace. And I don't know what a realm of peace is or how to live there. I think that, I think that now we're getting very far away from, dude, Jesus was asleep. That's all you read. And now he's living in a realm. There's a whole realm called peace now and you can live there somehow and, and then you can access. And I'm like, this is all extra biblical stuff. We're just adding things here that aren't in the text. Here's a quote from Bill Johnson. He says, when Jesus spoke peace to the storm, it sat down. He had the peace because he rested in conflict. He did so by releasing what was within him until it redefined his environment. This, I would say, is allegory to the point of bringing in new teachings that aren't in the text of scripture at all. 
because the application he's going to give you is that if you have this kind of peace, you can also do miraculous things. Um, it ties in with another teaching they have that you, um, that you can't give what you don't have. And even God, according to their rules, God isn't even allowed to give things he doesn't have. So God can't give disease because God's not diseased. And they're like, well, God gave tumors to the Philistines and God doesn't have tumors. So I don't think that that rule applies to God. He can give you a headache without having a headache if he wants. God can do whatever he wants. So it just seems strange. And, and this is where we're just going way beyond the text of Scripture. Um, it's cramming teaching into the Bible that just, it may seem nice and it may be encouraging. The question is, is it true? We don't gauge the truthfulness of a teaching based on how nice it is, but based upon whether it's biblically sound or not. Because to all this, I could say, what if Jesus was just tired? And the point of the passage then becomes our trusting in God in trials, not our trying to in, you know, become in a realm of peace where we have this sort of qualitative peace that can, we can sort of let out and then it changes our environment and all that kind of thing. And there's elements of truth to this, but it's way beyond probably what's warranted by reality or scripture. Um, the passage doesn't actually tell us why he was sleeping. So in summary, in summary, in conclusion, the right application is number one, Jesus is divine. Jesus is divine. The divinity, the glory, the, the magnificence of Jesus and the who he is, who is this man, he's divine. And we should not always go to the text asking, where am I in this passage? We should ask, what is it revealing? What truth is it revealing to me? Then you can apply it to you. If we start with the revelation of Jesus, then the application to us comes naturally. And the application to us, point number two is, don't fear with that kind of terror. Trust in him. Trust in him. I absolutely think getting your eyes in a sense so that you're not just looking at the, the storm or the situation or the hardship of your life right now, but you're also looking at the goodness of God and the character of God and the love of God so that you won't pray, Lord, did you even care? Because now you know it's oh you of little faith. Trusting God's character, trusting in the who in the middle of the what, that's, that's massive. You're never going to outgrow this lesson. You're just going to keep learning it over and over again in your life to trust in God and his goodness, no matter what the scenario is, no matter what's going on. Uh, because circumstances are going to constantly push this button to find out where your faith is and how much trust you have in him. Now, if you feel like you failed, so did the disciples. Right here they failed. And Jesus used it as a lesson. And sometimes you're going through trials and you find yourself doubting even God's own goodness. It's revealing that you've always had a problem with faith. And God knew it. I want, to, I want to kind of say like, hey, it's okay. Get up, learn the lesson, put your trust in who he is. Go from being in awe of how bad situations are to being in awe of how amazing God is and his goodness. Let's pray. Father, we, we're recognizing right now um, that this does apply very directly into our lives, into our situations, storms, so to speak. We want to trust in you. We want to trust in your goodness. God, you are the grounding of all reality. You, you couldn't be less than wonderfully good and trusting, trustworthy. Your character and your love and your compassion, Lord. Um, we want to trust that regardless of temporary pain or hardship or unexpected suffering that we might be going through. And so, Lord, we say and we proclaim, you are good, you are holy. We're in awe of you. And we do appeal for help in our trials, help and assistance in the suffering and the, in the pain and all that kind of stuff. But, Lord, we want to learn the lesson you were trying to teach the disciples and by virtue of them trying to teach us that we would trust you and your goodness and your character and realize that our situation is sometimes just being used by the enemy to get us to distrust who you are like he tried with Job. But may we be those who just humbly say, yeah, I don't understand what's going on, but I know God is good and I trust in him and I wait on him. In Jesus' name, amen.